At the end of 2019, one Silicon Valley darling was poised for its biggest year yet. The economy has just been on this like uninterrupted march for 10 years. And, you know, right at the leading edge of that wave has been these Silicon Valley unicorns who, you know, just raised huge sums of money riding basically unlimited investor enthusiasm for all the ways the tech is going to eat the economy. The company was Airbnb, the home rental platform. It had done a couple of things. It had taken this marketplace concept, right, where companies don't really make or buy or own or sell things. They just sort of sit in the middle of people who have the thing that consumers want and the consumers who want to buy it. And just like many mature startups, the company was ready to go public. Morning, Mike, that's right. Airbnb putting out a press release stating its intention to become a public company in 2020, which would make it one of the most high profile IPOs of next year. Now, this in 2020. And get this. It doesn't need the money. So in let's 2020, think. 2020, probably making it one of the most high profile listings and market debuts next year. But uh, earlier this week, Airbnb, they said they took in more than a billion dollars in revenue. And so to set the scene a little, Brian Chesky, who's uh, who's Airbnb's CEO, you know, is spending the holidays in 2019 bopping. He's in the Caribbean, he's in Orlando, he's in New York, and he brings with him a stack of it's called S1, the prospectuses. And this is, you know, a long, dry, lawyerly document. But sort of wrapped inside of it is the origin story for any public company. You're trying to go public and you have to tell your story to investors for what's going to be the most momentous thing any startup can do, which is list, and ring the bell. Chesky's trying to figure out, what's the story I want to tell with this IPO? Brian is a really interesting kind of introspective a little navel-gazing guy, and he's really thoughtful about what he wants the story to be. He'd read a piece in the Times of London that stuck with him. And it says 2020 is going to be the year of connection. And this light bulb goes off in his head, like, yes. Like, we've been increasingly, social media has become this divisive, toxic thing that pits people against each other. And we can sit at the middle of that social commerce web and we can bring people together. And that's the story that I want to tell. That's what 2020 is going to be about. <laughs> Instead of connection, we all know 2020 would end up being a year of isolation for a lot of people. Coronavirus brought travel to a standstill, and Airbnb's promising year would take a sharp turn. By the end of February, revenue at the home sharing group was not only reaching zero, they were approaching negative territory with customers asking for refunds. So they need money. As everyone did, you know, in the in March and April of 2020, they badly need cash. You're just burning tens of millions of dollars I mean, a day, just constantly. I mean, just that that's not going to last long. An IPO was one way to raise cash, but this was no time to try to go public. Markets were cratering, and the company itself was struggling to keep up with the ever-changing environment. And the idea that they could go public as planned in, in the summer now just seems, I mean, not only preposterous, the real question is, would they make it to the summer? You have to remember, like, take yourself back to those early days, the idea that you would like, A, leave your home, people are like putting up caution tape on their front door, and B, go to a stranger's home just seemed insane. I fully expected Airbnb to end up on the scrap heap. In March 2020, Airbnb looked as though it might not survive the economic shock of the pandemic. Today, it's valued at nearly $80 billion and just made the Fortune 500 list. In this episode, how Airbnb managed a turnaround in the midst of one of the most volatile periods in recent economic history. This is The Closer. I'm Amy Keen. My guest this week is journalist Liz Hoffman. I'm the business and finance editor at Semaphore, and I sort of what qualifies as a longtime scribe of Wall Street by now. She recently wrote a book about the way several U.S. companies navigated the pandemic. It's called Crash Landing, the inside story of how the world's biggest companies survived an economy on the brink. So just to place you in the story, where did you spend those early weeks and months in 2020? In my apartment in Brooklyn. You know, I remember very clearly and this is something I tried to keep in mind as as I reported and wrote the book. Like, I remember very clearly sitting in the Tampa airport. Uh, my family had gone to an island in the Gulf for a couple of days. Uh, and it, we'd sort of joked about canceling it, but it was kind of half-hearted. And I remember sitting in the Tampa airport on March 8th, coming back to New York, 
And my sister-in-law had stolen some of those like wet naps from Chick-fil-A. And I was like, just like wipe stuff down. And so I'm sitting there like wiping down the armrest, just feeling unbelievably foolish. Um, you know, back to the office. My last day in the office was March 11th. So, you know, it happened so quickly. Let's go back to Airbnb. The company started in 2007 as a way for CEO Brian Chesky and his roommate to make some money renting an air mattress in their home. And by 2020, it had become a giant. It was branching out into transportation, tours, and other vacation experiences. It was also becoming the ire of residents in highly sought-after vacation destinations for driving up rental prices. And in its most recent funding round, the company was valued at $31 billion. But like most other startups... Uh, Airbnb spent more than it brought in. It was losing money on basically every every booking, uh, which is fine as long as two things are happening, right? The top line is continuing to grow, which means that investors sort of see uh, profits ahead and they'll keep giving you money. And they were stuck right between, as you point out, this last big fundraising round that had like really truly announced them as, you know, had dropped them on the doorstep of the public markets and then going public and replacing, you know, that private venture money with grown up public company, public market, you know, shareholder money. And this is a real high wire act that they are on. Um, And right into the middle of that, basically, their revenue just goes away. It just essentially is on a path to dropping to zero. In February 2020, Chesky's keeping a close eye on Airbnb's global activity on a special dashboard. Yeah, it's an iPad that has sort of all these, you know, dials and and levers and, you know, things you can dial up and dial down and the numbers and the charts. But it's really, I mean, it's a, it's the pulse of the company. It is forecasting out demand. It is real-time bookings. It is real-time cancellations. It is cash flow, the vital signs of a company. And for Airbnb, they were, I mean, just tanking unbelievably quickly. The three weeks between sort of early February and the end of the month, something like 80% fall off in China, which is a small but very fast growing market and obviously, you know, a precursor as the virus kind of marched, marched west. And so he's watching these numbers just fall off a cliff and he dashes off a note to his board of directors. He says, for the first time, Airbnb is a smaller company than it was a year ago. We are now shrinking. And that's just such dirty word in Silicon Valley where kind of the name of the game is just continuous growth. you got to get bigger, bigger, bigger. And the second you start shrinking is the moment that a startup starts to die. So not only were those summer IPO plans paused, the company's entire future was unclear. There were these kinds of companies that were so, like, existentially hit where just their business didn't seem to make sense anymore. Just the entire business model was like, this is built for a world that doesn't exist anymore and feels utterly alien. Um, And I think Airbnb was just like the best example of that. There's a very real chance that they just went away here and that we just went back to going to hotels. So Chesky's got or Airbnb has some cash on hand. And, you know, in in real terms, it seems like a lot of money, but it's definitely not going to be enough to stem the just the outpouring of cash at this moment. Who does he turn to? So he turned to these two Wall Street banks who he had been working with, you know, towards an eventual IPO. This is Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, kind of the two premier investment banks, particularly in Silicon Valley. They have, you know, more or less a lock on these big hot startups that are going public. And he kind of he kind of gives them each a job. Morgan Stanley is supposed to negotiate with Airbnb's existing lenders. They have this big bank loan held with a bunch of banks that they kind of need they need to extend or amend because they're about to be in violation of the terms of it. And that's a defaulting is a very bad thing to, to do in that situation. So they've got the debt side. And Goldman Sachs has the equity side, which is we're going to need some stockholder money here. We've been counting on getting public money from the public market investors. Doesn't look like that's going to happen. We're going to need to raise some money. And it's sort of a neat division of labor. It also, it also pokes at sort of Wall Street's innate competition, and particularly between these two firms, to kind of go out and, and find the best deal for, for their client. So that's that's happening, you know, in the middle of March. And he basically says, look, I, I need about $2 billion. So like, go figure out how to get it. The man in charge of figuring out how to get that money at Goldman Sachs is longtime banker Greg Lemkow. He is, at the time, the co-head of the investment banking division at the bank. Greg Lemkow is like central casting for an investment banker. He's tall. He's got good hair. He's gregarious. He's charming. 
you know, I've, I've covered Wall Street, and particularly I covered Goldman for a long time. And I think he's probably the only person I can say this about. I've never heard a bad word about him. Like genuinely everyone. He seems annoyingly likable. And, you know, is his a real way with clients? He came up as a, a technology banker and did a lot of media deals, you know, has the ear of, of really some of the most influential people in the Valley and, and really in, in sort of corporate America and, and beyond. So um, a really just classic investment banker. And he has fled New York with his family and is spending at least this part of the pandemic in what sounds like a very exclusive uh, oceanside community in Hawaii. Yes. So yeah, Greg has decamped to uh, to Hawaii. This is on the Kona coast. It's a, very, a private community called the Kukio Golf Club. And um you know, very moneyed set. George Roberts from KKR has a home there. Warren Buffett's sister has a home there. It had been served for a while by this uh, this weekly flight from Oakland called the Kona Express. So all the Silicon Valley set would, of would course. pop out. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not quite the Hamptons Jitney, but at the same time. <laughs> and in normal times, these guys have, you know, walked along the beach and done a round of golf and batted around some deal ideas. But here they are sort of stuck in their own homes and they probably could have thrown a baseball and hit each other. Um, but all the talks that are going to happen are, are sort of happening in these little silos that, you know, I think really kind of echo how we all did our jobs in those early days. At this stage of the game, Goldman has a few interested investors lined up, but Lemkow has another idea up his sleeve. He calls up Egon Durbin, who's a private equity executive at Silver Lake. And these guys are old friends. Greg had helped put together the deal where uh, Silver Lake took Dell private many years ago, which just made everyone involved huge, huge sums of money. These guys know each other really well. And so he calls Egon and he says, hey, have you guys ever looked at Airbnb? And in fact, uh, Egon had just had a call with his team a day or two earlier and said, look, there's going to be bargains you know, in this in this crisis, but I don't want you throwing money at dumb companies like Airbnb. So that, that's the backdrop for this conversation. But, you know, Egon knows Greg really well. They've done a lot of deals together, uh, most of which have made Silver Lake bags of money. And, and Greg says, listen, Brian Chesky, he's the real deal. And I think there's a real opportunity here. You should think about it. And so he does. Your goal as a banker is to just keep at least two horses in the race because then you can play them off each other. It's a competitive dynamic. And so Goldman had already reached out to a bunch of investors and basically had interest from three big private equity firms. And they're they're kind of interested in, in sort of teaming up to put some new cash in now. But again, any good banker knows you have to create a bidding war. And Greg thinks that Silver Lake is a pretty good stocking horse here. They have this great reputation investing in technology. They can write huge checks. And he has this really good rapport and history with the senior leadership over there. And so he thinks this is this is his way in. And meanwhile, there's another guy just down the beach from both Lemkow and Durbin by the name of Alan Waxman, who gets a tip of his own about this potential uh, investment opportunity with Airbnb. Yeah. So Alan Waxman, goes by Wax, had gotten a call from someone he knew in the Valley, sort of the got, got a tip that Airbnb was considering raising money. And he gets this text from a VC in mid-March, says, board's meeting Wednesday, recent performance is awful, no new bookings, lots of refunds, unclear what the bottom will be. And this is the kind of thing that might scare like your typical investor, but is music to Alan Waxman's ears. You know, he came up at Goldman Sachs doing these really bespoke, complicated deals, sort of living where everyone else was scared, right on the edge of sort of distressed investing. And they would create all these kind of Frankenstein deals that were actually sort of built to be safe on the downside, but have huge upside, exactly what every investor wants and can ever find. And he's intrigued. You know, it's not clear exactly what the ask is. And this tip has come in over the transoms. It's not like you can just call up Brian Chesky and be like, hey, I hear you're in a lot of trouble. The other thing to know about Alan Waxman is that he's been suspicious for a while about these sky-high valuations for unprofitable tech companies. He is, at heart, a credit investor, and people who invest in credit, who lend money, tend to be fairly pessimistic by nature, whereas people who buy stock tend to be pretty optimistic by nature. You have to think about Debt can go to zero, but stocks can go to infinity. And he is the debt guy, and he thinks that there's just a lot of shenanigans and a lot of funny money. But he likes Airbnb as a business. He just thinks the valuation that's been slapped on it is stupid. 
And here we are at a moment where, you know, that's going to be tossed out with the trash. um, And there's going to be an opportunity to put new money into this company at a much, much lower level. And he is super interested. So Waxman takes a step. He gives Silver Lake's Egon Durbin a call. So... Sixth Street, which is the firm he runs, now it's pretty big. But at the time, it was fairly small. And the kind of money that Airbnb needed, talking about $2 billion, that's just too big a check for them to write. But he knew that what Sixth Street brought to the table was the sort of deep understanding of kind of complicated investment structures, but that they really needed some credibility on the tech side and that Silver Lake was an obvious place to go. So without knowing that Silver Lake had been in touch with Goldman. He kind of closes that loop on his own. He calls Egon Durbin and says, you know, we're thinking about offering Airbnb a lifeline, maybe a billion, maybe two billion, but that's a lot for us. Would you be interested in partnering? And Egon says, you know, actually, I just got a call on this and I said I wasn't interested. And Alan Waxman says, well, I think it's fucking interesting and let me tell you how we're thinking about it. And so that's sort of the start of what became you know, I think really one of the defining Wall Street deals of the early pandemic taking place like inside these, you know, mansions on a beach in Hawaii trying to save a company that's got, you know, hundreds of thousands of rental properties all over the world. Waxman walks Durbin through his thinking. They could make a loan of $1.5 billion that charged about 11% a year in interest. And crucially, they'd receive warrants or the right to buy a portion of Airbnb stock in the future at a steep discount. You know, this looks, if you were sort of starting from first principles, this looks like a deal that you would offer a company that's in a lot of trouble, but that you think is going to make it. Which is to say, we don't really want to take a stake in you and be exposed to you know, a stock price that is rapidly tanking. But we know you need cash, and we think you're going to be good for it down the road. So we're going to lend you money. It's going to cost you a lot. Remember, at the time, interest rates were near zero. Companies could borrow, you know, low single digits. It's going to be 10 11%. But also, we want to be able to share in the upside. If our financial lifeline gets you over, gets you through this crisis, and you come out stronger, we want to participate in that. Without this money, Airbnb would absolutely have been dead. And the cost of that was a pretty humbling valuation cut to about $15 billion, so less than half of what Airbnb had been valued at, you know, the last time it raised money. So Waxman lays out his thinking to Durbin, Durbin being somewhat skeptical of investing in Airbnb at this moment. How did how did Waxman win him over? Well, and again, remember, we talked about Sixth Street is a is a conservative firm. They build these really special deals that, I mean, on the whole, like very rarely lose money. And you know, Egon had a lot of respect for Alan Waxman and that firm and said, you know, listen, if it's actually if this is interesting enough for them, like maybe I ought to give it another look. I also remember that his old buddy Greg had been whispering in his ear about what a home run this was going to be. He said, you know, Brian Chesky's the real deal. You're going to want to be in business with these guys. And this is, you know, a way in at a much lower price. This was going to be a big signature deal. We'll be back after the break. On March 27, 2020, investment group Sixth Street sends Airbnb an offer. They propose loaning the alien company a billion dollars, plus an additional $500 million in debt that would convert to shares in the company. With these terms, the company that was worth $31 billion just three years earlier would effectively be valued at half of that now. Airbnb counters a little. Instead of the investors getting warrants for 1.75% of the company, Airbnb proposes 1.5%. You have to counter a little bit, but I think that counter really reflected that they were not not really in a position to play hardball. But before a deal can be agreed, there's a bit of a wrinkle on the debt side. So companies like Airbnb maintain these lines of credit with a group of banks. Um, you could think of it like a corporate credit card, except instead of you know just saying Chase on the front, it's got six or eight banks that all sort of own a piece of it. Airbnb was at risk of violating some of the fine print, and so they needed to renegotiate it. And the banks were being a pain in the ass. This is, you know, mid-late March of 2020. Banks are really scared because everybody is pulling their lines of credit at the same time. And the funny thing about these products is they're sort of designed in a lab to be problematic. Banks basically give them away for free as lost leaders hoping to get hired when the company does a big m a deal. But they're totally underpriced. And then when like the world goes to hell, everyone pulls, everyone needs the money at the same time. And that's what starts happening in March of 2020, which is companies start pulling their lines of credit 
like crazy. And banks are washing these loans that they've kind of, in theory, promised, but never actually had to fund. And money is just like whooshing out the door. And so the banks here are being really skittish, in particular Bank of America, which is sort of the lead lender on this. That could have blown up like the entire deal. Um, this is, you think about these capital structures as kind of a Jenga tower. And if like one piece is not in the right spot, the whole thing falls down. And so Morgan Stanley, if you remember, had been put in charge of, of that piece. Their lead banker is this guy named Michael Grimes, who is like a real Silicon Valley impresario, the tech founder whisperer um, on Wall Street. And he says, actually, this is great. Let's just scrap the revolver. We don't need it. These guys are being pains in the asses. Like, let's just let's get them out of it. We'll clean up the capital structure. We'll get a little bit more from the new investors. And this will be great. And uh, and I think one Airbnb executive later, you know, told me it was a Houdini move, sort of a a very seemingly elegant escape from, you know, a, a big, complicated problem. And mere weeks after banker Greg Lemkow called up Silver Lake's Egon Durbin, the deals agreed on April 6th. Sixth Street and Silver Lake were investing a billion dollars in Airbnb in a mix of debt and equity in a deal that valued the company at $18 billion. Sarah, Airbnb is raising a billion dollars even as the coronavirus outbreak continues to hit the travel industry particularly hard. I remember thinking, like, what are these? These guys are insane. Like, this business is dead in the water. And uh, and the fact that the money was so expensive tells you that Wall Street mostly agreed. But actually, like, they had a thesis. It was different from whatever everyone else thought. And they put a lot of money behind it. You know, I think what was interesting to me about the, the deal that they did was, you know, for a lot of the 2010s, like, there wasn't a lot of value in being contrarian on Wall Street. There just wasn't a lot of divergence. There was this sort of consensus that you couldn't fight the Fed and things were going to go up, and they did. And I think what was interesting to me about that deal was it was really contrarian at the time. A week later, news breaks that Airbnbs raised an additional $1 billion in financing from a group of institutional investors, bringing its total coronavirus funding to the $2 billion it was looking for at the beginning of March. Back at Airbnb, the mood would sour a little more before business picked up. In May, the company laid off a quarter of its workforce, citing lower-than-expected revenue. Even with the cash infusions, Airbnb said it had been hit hard by travel coming to a standstill. But later that month, the picture was already starting to improve. So they start to notice in the data on that dashboard that Chesky is like obsessively looking at, they start to notice that, you know, Bookings are coming back, but they look really different than the bookings, you know, that that went into the pandemic, which is that they're longer and they're actually more local. So they're starting to see again, rather than people, you know, go to London for a long weekend, they're actually seeing people in New York go upstate for like two or three weeks at a time or, you know, in Chicago, head up to the Upper Peninsula for like a month at a time. And they think, well, I don't know what this is, but like if it's working, it's working. Let's ride it. Policy was really being created on the fly, which is like remote work. What does that even look like? So they lean hard into long-term stays and, you know, a lot of dot, 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 but like basically it saved them. That was what got them through the pandemic and ultimately turned them within the span of about, you know, eight or 10 weeks from a a pandemic loser. And I don't even mean a pandemic loser, like a, a very close to being a corporate victim of the pandemic into one of its biggest winners. And so the the IPO that had been tabled quite quickly in February, when does that come back into the picture? It starts to come back by midsummer. Um, That's fast. Tell you, it's really fast yeah, when you think crazy. about it now. Just the whiplash on this whole thing. But yeah, they they kind of dust off the idea and say, actually, I think we can do it. You have to remember the other thing that's happening. This isn't happening in a vacuum. This huge uh, surge in stock prices starting in you know summer of 2020, in part because investors can see or really think they see because it turned out to be a bit illusory, but kind of think they see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so they they jump in with both feet. They file confidentially in the summer um, and they start talking with those same bankers again at, at Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs about how to rework that story they had been prepared to tell uh, for a world that has totally changed in the six months since. So they sort of take those documents and they say, we've got to tell a different story because this is a company that is actually valued at less today than it was when we first put together these prospectus documents. Um, how did they sell the company in this particular moment? So the the sort of 
heart of any IPO pitch is the deck. That's a Wall Street speak for a PowerPoint presentation. But this is what bankers pitch to the client. So here's how I would present you to the market. Here's the story that I would help you tell. And, you know, in the history of like Wall Street lore, like most of these that get tossed in the bonfire, never thought of again. But there's a couple that kind of become a little bit legendary. And, and this is one of them. You know, Morgan Stanley comes in, pitches Brian and the board and senior executives with this idea called the space of one. When you're trying to go out and, and sell a company to the public, you got to figure out what space do I occupy, right? Like what portion of the quadrant am I in? Who am I competing with? Who am I not competing with, right? And they threw that all out and said, don't try to compare yourself to anybody else. Like you, you will be in your own space. Like you will be master of your own domain. And that's the story that we're going to craft. And, you know, they sort of threw out some of the truisms that you see in typical IPOs. So rather than saying, most companies go public when they can point to like short term results that are pretty good. Like Airbnb would very proudly go public during the worst travel downturn, you know, on record. The other one that I always loved was ugh, CEOs often complain about the pressure they feel from investors to produce profits over a very short time period. Uh, one of Morgan Stanley's pitches, which absolutely delighted Brian was, quote, going public with a cer uncertain short term can only attract long term investors by definition, <laughs> which is to say this company was had such a bad track record behind it that the only investors who might possibly be willing to buy its stock like had to be prepared to stick around for a long time. Yeah, no kidding. You've just got to be in for the long haul, no matter what. This is a different kind of opportunity. The space of one. <laughs> yeah. And like, I, I liked it in sort of narrative of the book. I had sort of twinned it with this sort of isolation and these kind of weird public spaces that were being redesigned throughout the pandemic. But, you know, for Airbnb, it really, I think, told their story uh, pretty well. And like, certainly Wall Street bought it. Airbnb's story was going to be based on, I think it was like doing the impossible, which is like having gotten there at all. And on December 10th of the same year, Airbnb shares make their public market debut. So most people, I think, rightly think of Wall Street, particularly stock trading, as just a bunch of like computerized machines sort of doing their thing. And that's almost always true. But there is like one specific moment where um, there's a lot of human judgment involved. And it's when a company is going public for the first time and the bankers have to talk to a bunch of investors and figure out what is the price. What, what is the price at which this clears the market? And you actually don't know. It moves around a little bit that morning. It can take people a couple hours to figure it out. Typically around the time pricing is taking place, the CEO appears on CNBC or Bloomberg in anticipation of the listing. That's what Brian Chesky does. Here he is early in the San Francisco morning on Bloomberg TV. Now we just got indication on your opening price. And the reporter who's interviewing Brian Chesky just before Airbnb is supposed to start trading tells him, well, it looks like it's going to open at $139 a share. Which is more than double what you priced at. That was way above what anyone, even a day before, had been expecting. You know, it would value the company at, you know, $90, $100 billion. Think back to the valuation that had been slapped on it, you know, $18 billion just, you know, six months earlier. That's the first time I've heard that number. Um, that is, that's a... And this is actually the kind of moment that as a reporter you, you sort of dream of, which is like you have caught an important person by surprise. <laughs> so I I don't know what else to say. It, it's that that's a that's a, that's a very that that's um, that is yeah, I'm very humbled by it. Genuinely, it's written all over his face. I, I've never heard that number before. And you can see him kind of doing the math in his head and. You know, this company is worth almost $100 billion when it actually goes public a couple of minutes later. Actually, a little better. I think closer to 150 bucks a share. And like his own stake, he's on paper, he is immediately a multi-billionaire. I mean, just crazy. Airbnb has handed about $54 billion worth of value to investors who got in at its $68 IPO price announced yesterday. $146 a share, $146 a share for the opening trade. This values the company at more than $100 billion. $100 billion for a company that did less than $5 billion in revenue in its peak year 2019. Nobody cares about that. In the same year Airbnb looked like it might collapse, the company pulls off, by some measurements, one of the biggest IPOs in history. Absolutely gargantuan. 
And, you know, the beneficiary of a couple of different things, right? Like a genuinely successful pivot during a tough time. And just this wall of money that on some level was sort of there for anything in late 2020. And uh, yeah, it turned into one of the biggest debuts of all time. Sure. And also made uh, Silver Lake and Sixth Street look positively brilliant. I mean, this might sound like the most obvious question, but do you know how they felt? Uh, <laughs> I mean, very rich, very rich. <laughs> like this is this will go down for both of them as as uh, a, a deal that they point to. Just look at the very basic math, which is the valuation of this company, you know, quintupled in the six months that they held this piece of paper. So, I mean, just a huge win. I just, as a market watcher, found that kind of refreshing that like you could have an idea that was different than other people's and put your money where your mouth was and make a lot of it. You mentioned uh, earlier in our conversation just how critical this moment where they got the financing was, that without it, I mean, that could have just been spelled the end for Airbnb. What do you make of the way the company was able to manage this turnaround in such a short period of time? My approach to business is always it's better to be lucky than good, but it's helpful if you can be both. And I think Airbnb was both. The emergence of long-term stays which is actually just a technical way for saying that like consumer capitalism, even in the middle of a pandemic, finds a way, right? Like people do want to experience life and importantly, they want to spend money. But, you know, you have to be a management team that recognizes that and is willing to kind of cannibalize an existing business. Not that there was much of it at the time. But if you're going to pivot yourself to, you know, a, a sort of long term experiential company rather than, you know, for example, a market they've never really tapped and had wanted to and we'll see how they do is sort of the corporate travel market. But they've really fully positioned themselves as a consumer experience company. And that's, you know, not a foregone conclusion that a CEO would decide that's the right call. And then just the willingness to take an incredibly humbling haircut. I mean, that was really expensive money. And, you know, a lot of companies, you know, usually in crises, not quite as um, acute as a pandemic, are reluctant to, to sort of take the hit because of what it will look and the kind of message it will send. And so I think the team there deserves a lot of credit for, you know, swallowing their pride and moving quickly and raising a lot of money really fast, even though, you know, the headline number was was kind of a gut punch. That's the end of our show. But there's more from my conversation with Liz Hoffman. As our interview wrapped up, I asked what deal-making advice she took from reporting on the Airbnb pandemic turnaround. And she has something to offer for just about every role in the deal, including journalists. You can hear what she had to say on Brazen Plus on Apple Podcasts. The Closer is a production of Project Brazen in partnership with PRX. Our show is produced by Isabel Kirby McGowan and Ben Walsh. Marian Hel Gonzalez is our project manager, Olivia Mead is our researcher, and Lucy Woods is head of research. Golda Arthur is our showrunner, and Bradley Hope and Tom Wright are executive producers. Megan Dean is programming manager, and Ryan Ho is design lead. Our marketing consultant is Maggie Taylor, and Noor Abdel Latif is our podcast strategist. I'm Amy Keene. Thanks for listening. <laughs>